Hello and welcome. My name is Piers Ridyard, CEO of RDX Works, a core developer of the decentralized finance protocol Radix, a public ledger entirely focused on bringing DeFi into the mainstream. Today, we are going to be talking about Anthic. Anthic is a new intent based DEX designed to bring the liquidity of the crypto space onto the Radix platform. And with us, we have the core architect of Anthic. Josh, who is going to be talking through how Anthic works, what is special about what Anthic does with regards to intents, and how Anthic is going to be bringing that liquidity uh, and easy trade user trading experiences to the Radix platform and the Radix users. Josh, thank you so much for coming on the show. Cool. Thanks, Fierce. Glad to be here. So let's start off by talking a little bit about what, what we are trying to achieve with Anthic? Like, why is Anthic being built in the first place? And what was the opportunity that was sort of like seen as being possible as a combination of technology and partners and liquidity uh, that made it exciting? Um, I think the, the notion of, we've got AMMs currently, which is, uh, you know, the, the, main way that Radix, at least for most chains, provide liquidity for users who want to, um, you know, trade or swap on Ledger. Um, the problem with uh, AMMs is that a lot of that liquidity must be held in these in these pools. And um, I think this notion of being able to retrieve liquidity from outside um, it, 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 it gives us a lot of opportunity in terms of um, um, uh, giving users better spreads and that sort of thing. Um, and so that part is um, something that only um, the ability we have with, say, Instabridge, we're able to, you know, mint assets on the fly. And so with that ability to mint assets on the fly, like how did that overlap with the idea of trading? So like what, how, let, let's, let's sort of break it down in a very basic form. So what is an intent-based DEX and how does it, how's it different from a AMM? Uh, well, it, intent-based DEX is a, a, a further, a, a further advancement as well. Like besides the fact that you can mint things on the fly, the fact that we, um, could do it on Radix via Intense rather than being on Ledger is is a an even bigger advantage. Um, so speaking about intent based based DEXs, um, usually with regular AMMs, you need um, let's say two transactions to be able to uh, perform a trade. Um, you, you've got uh, let's say one one size the maker who's providing liquidity, and you've got the taker um, who is taking. Um, liquidity that the maker provides and um with amms you've got the maker adding liquidity um into a pool and then the taker uh, calling swap on that pool and so that's two transactions with intent-based systems um that matching or that bundling of of uh two people who um want to do a trade is all done off ledger um and that's what the intents uh intents allow you to do so if you could sign a piece of uh, a message essentially um, specifying the order what do I want um, and then have a have the uh, another the other side also do the same thing you now have two um, two sides which uh, side um, cryptographically that they want these things and then all we need to do is bundle these two into a transaction and then um, we've now um, um, made those two transactions into one. That may not seem like a lot, but it's actually, it's not necessarily the fact that it's two transactions that have been made into one. It, a lot of it has to do as well with um, the coordination of getting um, these two sides is all done off ledger. And because of that, you have so much more efficiency in, in terms of um, you uh, you don't need to worry about uh, on ledger ordering. You, you don't have that bottleneck um, to do this coordination that you need between these two sides, and th that's the real big power. 
this and that basis. I suppose, I suppose if you think about it, it's sort of moving the actions from asynchronous actions to synchronous actions as well. You're saying for for marketplaces where you want there to be a base level of liquidity. So if you're looking at like bootstrapping a new token, um, it makes sense that you have a maker who is providing liquidity into a pool at a set spread of pricing. And that pricing doesn't necessarily update very often. It only updates when it trades. But when you're looking at a multi-venue asset, something like Bitcoin or ETH or DOT or something like that, you have all of these places that are constantly trading the price, which means that you constantly, as a maker, you don't want to be selling your tokens below value. Uh, and uh -huh. you don't want to be pricing above the market because then your pricing isn't competitive. So you have all of these different venues that are constantly updating their pricing. And so if you trade on Coinbase or you trade on Kraken or you trade on Binance, you'll see the price move like on a very, very regular basis. And often that price is moving not because it's being traded, but because the makers are moving the liquidity on the order book to reflect what the actual pricing is versus other venues. But yeah. when you have a, a, a AMM, that becomes very difficult because your, your pricing is a lot more static. You're essentially, as an AMM, having to go, I'm putting pricing into this range, and then I'm leaving that range there for it to be traded at some point. But if you're looking at sort of very high frequency traded, very liquid trading tokens, that doesn't really work. And so what you need is you need this ability for someone who wants to come on the market and buy. Um, so a taker to be able to buy at exactly the right price at every single moment and, and moment to moment that pricing is going to change. And yep. so what, what you're, what, what we're doing with Anthic is creating this ability for market makers to accurately express what the actual price, the actual market price is on a moment to moment basis for the tokens that, that a user might want to trade and then the user is able to come along and take that price at the point that they that they see it and say okay i want to trade at that price and so by making this atomic atomic and synchronous what you're essentially doing is you're making sure that the maker is able to get to give the best pricing and the taker is able to get the best pricing at a moment by moment basis and you're doing all of this off ledger so you're not you're avoiding all of the costs that you get associated with having to do an on ledger transaction and you only get an on ledger transaction at the point that both sides are actually matched with each other uh, and you and you have a successful set of transactions that can be executed on Ledger. And what's interesting about this is those those transactions essentially just look like uh, they look like a transfer. They're relatively simple transactions in total, right? So that you're actually got a lot less complexity that the Ledger has to deal with from the point of view of the processing of the transaction as well. Would that be right to say? Uh, yeah, I think so. I, I think the the main point is I think like you alluded to. The biggest point is that the maker, um, especially when I, I would, I don't think it's necessarily liquid assets, but like very volatile assets, where um, a maker oh, needs to be very dynamic in terms of how they express the liquidity they're doing. Um, you could theoretically do this on an AMM, right? Um, I, as a mar market maker, can buy or remove my liquidity and, and trade things to move the price to where I want it. But then um, again you're using basically the ledger as a there's that bottleneck that everything needs to be ordered so i can't necessarily cancel this range of prices like immediately when i want to um like you would normally be able to do with uh traditional um, order books um yeah. so yeah and i think i think what's really interesting about this system as well is how it works for the user so um a lot of the problems that you see within um AMMs as well is this idea of like front running, um, where you can see an order come in, and as a result of the order coming in, you can change as a maker the liquidity profile of what that order is actually going to be executed against by inserting a transaction ahead by paying gas fee to do so. So you can essentially decide the order at which things are executed. In this, you essentially have a uh, almost a um, it's a bit more like uh, 
is a bit more blinded. So from a market maker point of view, what they're doing is they're constantly streaming their best price. They're saying, this is my best price for BTC versus USDC. This is my best price for ETH versus USDC. This is my best price for whatever, right? And that pricing is then being aggregated together as the pricing across multiple market makers. And then the other side, you have the taker who is being able to see that aggregate pricing. They're going, okay, well, I'm getting for USDC versus ETH across these three market makers or these four market makers, these five market makers, I'm getting this price at this size. So if I want to trade $10,000, a dollar, a million dollars, I can see what pricing I'm going to get. And then Uh at the point that they are being executed, um, it's only then that the market maker actually discovers what the trade that is being requested is, but they've already given their price. So they don't get to give a price before the trade happens. And they also don't get to change their pricing according to the what trade is actually being done. They essentially get this, the, this, this, this finalization where it's like, you gave this price, the user said that they want to execute at this price, and now you, you have to confirm it. Now you can reject it, but you can't put a transaction ahead of that transaction and go, actually, I'm going to put change the liquidity and I'm going to change the pricing on the user. It, it makes sure that the user is getting the best price, the best possible price based on what is being streamed. And then the and then the system, the market maker or, or the bots that are involved in it can't then sandwich transactions in between, right? Right, right, right. Yeah, the sandwich attack essentially right, that you see on uh, AMMs. Um, yeah. I, I mean, it, it's essentially with, with the system we're building, it'll definitely act more like a limit order, right? Um, rather than like a, a market order, but with no bounds, which is where the sandwich stack comes in. Um, yeah. And, and so this limit order is, is using, essentially using the invariant that you can put into the transaction manifest, right? It's allowing you to say, I want to execute at this price and I, you know, I'm willing to accept this amount of slippage, let's say, you know, sort of 0.5% slippage or whatever, um, uh-huh. And this is this this is mainly to deal with latency, right? So the latency between when the user signs the transaction intent and when the uh, the transaction is executed, there can be a little bit of variation in pricing just based on how frequently the market maker is updating the pricing versus when the user sees the price, they sign the price, and then it goes goes into the system. But ultimately, the the it, the invariancy, the ability to add these slippage bounds means that the user isn't going to end up getting something radically different, which is different from a market order, which is you're just basically saying, I'll take whatever the market can give me. With this, you're you're still putting a boundary of what you're willing to trade at from the user. So the user gets the security of being able to say what range they trade at. And then the market maker is able to execute on that based on the best price that they've been giving at that moment when it comes in for their for their final confirmation, right? Yeah, exactly. And, and, and I think the important part here is like, even though Antic is, you could say, an intent-based systems are somewhat centralized because, you know, you're not, as a user, you're not submitting your intent or transaction to the ledger, you're submitting it to a server that Antic is running. Um, there are still those bounds um, within the intents that Anthic and nobody else can ever um, change, right? So if I put in this limit order, I'm always going to get this amount, at least this amount uh, for this other thing. I would say the, the, the biggest thing, the biggest drawback probably in terms of like using Anthic um, as a centralized service is that you don't have the guarantees of uh, availability. Um, Antic may be down. Um, Antic, for what if you don't trust them, they may like block your request for whatever reason. Um, but you'll always have full control of your funds. So that's like, um, as opposed to centralized exchanges where they're the custodians of the funds, and so you give up that control. Um, so. Yeah, there is. I, I see Anthic as like being in this nice um, middle ground between uh, the benefits of centralized exchanges and the benefits of uh, self custody and um, then using Web three D five on ledger. Right, because like the, the 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 thing you're giving up is the ability to. 
directly interact with a non-ledger object. You're you're instead you're creating a a cryptographically signed intent that's saying I have an intent to trade this asset for this asset, uh, and it has to respect these boundaries. And as long as that can be satisfied, then that will that can go ahead and be t- turned into a real transaction by a solver. So maybe we can talk a little bit about solvers. So like once the user has said, "Yep, I want to I want to trade at that price for these two for for this asset to this asset," and a market maker has gone, "Yep, I'm happy to lock in this price for that user," then then what happens? Um. Yes, yeah, so the user sends in their signed subintent. We call intent subintents, um, and uh, market maker will, um, uh, given that they 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 showed their price, they're going to you know sign their subintent. So essentially, now we are gathering a bunch of subintents, both from takers and makers, um, and essentially at this point, you you've got what's essentially a bunch of limit orders, um, which um, which um, the coincidence of wants this limit order matches this limit order. They both want um, the same matching thing. A solver can now take those two things and with uh, and essentially combine those two subintents within one transaction and um, be able to submit that transaction themselves. Right, and I, I think this is the the really interesting thing about subintents is that the the subintent itself is a off ledger signed thing and then you have um you have these actors who can gather these subintents together and push them on ledger which also adds the really interesting property of essentially gasless transactions right from the point of view of the user i don't have to have xrd i don't have to even understand what xrd is i just have to have the asset that i want to trade from available to me to be able to yep. trade and then from that point forwards everything else is is dealt with by the economics of the system yeah exactly and i mean gasless transactions is like one thing i i think i'm like super excited with the, with the sub intent stuff like you know, it's kind of like a side thing like we went to to like make antic work but there's like a whole range of things that that just this thing opens up to i think Based on my research, like I don't think there is any other chain out there or VM which is uh, which treats intents like we do, as in in terms of our system. Because we started out with this manifest, and then we've just been able to extend this manifest um, to account for intents. Um, and the fact that it's a actually a system level thing, and that everybody um, can use the same. Um, standardized intent. Uh, I, I think it's going to be super cool. Um, what people and can build with this. So what it's a bit things, of a tangent. What, there. what you know? No, absolutely. But like, let's talk about it. What other things do you think are exciting or interesting about sub intents? What, what do you think they enable? And like, how does that differ from other other layer ones? Um, I mean, I think layer ones. First of all, they they do have intents. Um, yeah, they already do have intents, but they they all of their intents are sort of in the application layer. As in, there's there's nothing really that standardizes everybody, so everybody can use the same intent infrastructure essentially. That's fully composable with everything that's already existing. That's like the crazy thing, right? Like people have already written all these, uh, you know, great um, blueprints and components that are on system intents automatically work without everything that's out there right now, um, with no extra, um, development. Um, so I think that that's the part that's, that's super powerful. Um, other things that we can do with intense, um, I had a list, <laughs> but, uh, um, you could do things like, um, atomic swaps, for example. Um, you could do things like uh, Trove's whole ecosystem, where you, where you have um, you're selling NFTs that can be all done off ledger, rather than requiring two transactions to kind of create that swap. One to post when I'm trying to sell, and the other to buy. That could all be done off ledger. Um, this could also be done with auctions. You could you could uh, take uh, have some sort of auction where you gather everybody's intents. Um, that they're auctioned for this sort of thing. 
and then do all that complicated logic on a server rather than on Ledger, and then post the final result on Ledger. So it's essentially um, like taking the, the the marketplace logic off Ledger, allowing people to make much more complicated systems, uh, and then only have the on Ledger bit for the settlement. But the on Ledger settlement part is trustless from the point of view of nothing can be done against the user apart from what the user's original intent was in the first place. So you can yeah. you can you can create much more complicated systems that can be much faster than an on ledger an on ledger only system um and you can do it for a large number of different applications it doesn't just have to be trading um it can be for i suppose in many ways you can think of it as more like a web 2 to web 3 kind of system where your your listing of things and your offering of things is all done for free and it's only once you actually have a matching of whatever the intent of the sort of the buyer and the seller of the parties are that are all brought together that you actually end up having to pay for anything. Yeah, exactly. So it's like you, you move, I mean, most of DeFi, most of the, most of trading, whatever, a lot of it is like a coordination problem, right? You're getting, you're trying to get a bunch of people to agree towards some result, Um, and essentially with this is like you could take what whatever that logic is you could take a subset of that coordination and move that off ledger whether that's like the most expensive part or whether that's like a you know a very hard np complete type problem um then uh just move that off ledger do that there and then yeah do settlement on ledger when when it's all done so let's talk a little bit about um dex integrations and sort of like dex front end so like caviar aussie swap DeFi plaza all of these platforms um obviously they have their own on ledger pools of liquidity that they want to pull from like how does how does the anthic system overlap or allow these dexes to enable them to use their on ledger liquidity as well as the anthic liquidity like how can you compose that together and make that all atomic so that I'm as a user, I'm simultaneously able to take advantage of, you know, for example, the um, XRD versus USDC pool uh, on on um, Aussie Swap at the same time as being able to take advantage of the XRD USDC pair that is being offered by the market maker on Anthic. How's that work? Um, yeah, I, I think there are, just speaking maybe more generally, there, there are a couple of ways to do this. The approach we're taking with uh, with Anantic is that um, as the DEX or as the aggregator front end, you're the one that's going to be presenting the intent to the user uh, to use the wallet. This intent, um, like I mentioned earlier, can include any calls to any existing components, any existing AMMs. So, um, if I, as a user, want to trade, let's say um, one BTC for uh, fifty thousand dollars. Um, that intent, and let's say I'm, uh, I'm doing this on, in the Aussie swap front end, um, that intent could start with, I want to swap uh, half a Bitcoin for $25,000 using this um, Aussie swap pool and deposit it into my account. And then the second part of that intent, I'm going to um, withdraw $25,000 um, we call this yield, yield to parents. So we're giving up the $25,000, but then we expect half a Bitcoin. And so that's the sub-intent part. This is the the, um, the parts that, uh, um, the assertions that can't be broken for this sub-intent to, to succeed. So essentially both the swap and my, the half, uh, half of my fill is done by the swap. Half of the fill is done by some arbitrary thing that's going to fill this, um, whoever submits the subintent. And so that's one subintent. I, I signed that thing. And so that whole subintent only gets committed if everything within that subintent um, passes, um, right. um, gets committed. And so that whole thing is now atomically uh, committable while being able to use both Austin Swap liquidity and Antic liquidity. So this enables the the the, the dex the dex is already on Radix to pull from their own pools, 
but make sure that from a user perspective, the transaction only succeeds when both components of it, the on-ledger cross swapping across an AMM functions correctly and the Anthic provided liquidity also functions correctly as well. Yes. Very cool. Very cool. Of course, I mean, there are, there are other ways around this as well. Like maybe you could more traditionally would be like, I only do things based off of my account and this is my limit order. And it's usually the solvers who will be looking for a range of pools and they grab their liquidity from there to fill my thing. That's kind of another approach. But um, I think for this version, we're, we're going to do this approach. Right. So so the, the, the DEX is fulfill a bit more of the solver role. Um, and they decide where the liquidity is being pulled from and how the trade is being divvied up between the various components. And then once that happens, um, it then gets pushed onto the ledger by the, by the solvers. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So maybe we can talk a little bit about sort of the, the provision of liquidity and like existing intent DEXs. One of the things that we often saw, I often saw when I was speaking with market makers was the complexity of providing liquidity to intent-based DEXs in the first place because you had to essentially bring your inventory to the ledger in the first place. So like Maybe. if you want to provide liquidity against the USDC BTC pair or against the ETH USDC pair or against any of the other pairs, you have to have the on-ledger you have to have that liquidity available on Ledger. Yep. Whereas that's in what I was trying end, to say. My, I thought I was trying to say my first statement, but you said it way better. <laughs> right. Right. Um, what and about liquidity provisioning. Liquidity yeah. provisioning. Yeah, exactly. Um, and your the with with Anthic, what you're essentially getting via Instabridge is you're getting this this line of credit, and a market maker is getting this line of credit. And this line of credit allows them to express the liquidity across every single pair that they're providing um, pricing to. So they can say, okay, well, I'm providing liquidity on all of these pairs. And um, because they're intense, I'm not actually trading on it. I'm only trading on it at the point that a user comes along and says, hey, I want to take you at this. I want to take you at that. What this does is it changes quite drastically the way in which liquidity can be provided because normally a market maker will only scale up the available liquidity on a venue based on the amount of trading volume that occurs on that venue because uh -huh. you have to make a you have to make a return on capital um, uh -huh. and so if i want to be providing you know a million dollars of liquidity on each side or 10 million dollars of liquidity on each side to do that on a venue, I have to know that I'm going to be yielding 10%, 12%, 15%, 20% per annum, right? So on a million dollars, I need to be looking at, I need to be seeing $200,000 of trading profit that I can make from bringing that inventory to that platform, which creates its own, its own bootstrapping problem in DEXs. Because what you often see is these DEXs have to subsidize a huge amount, the amount of uh, the, the, the market makers for it to make sense for them to bring the inventory there in the first place. Even if no trading is occurring, the market maker has to have inventory available for them to well, be able to trade at that size. It, it's a uh, chicken and egg problem, right? Like they right. want volume. You're not going to add liquidity without volume. And you're not going to get volume if you don't have liquidity. So it's right. like, yeah, yeah. Right. But with this, what you have is you have this line of credit that allows you to mint a head of settlement or allows the market maker to mint a head of settlement, which means that they don't have to be opinionated about what inventory they have to hold. They can say, look, here's the top 50 pairs and I'm going to offer deep liquidity on every single one of these pairs as available to trade on the market. And then anytime someone comes and trades against me, at that point, I'm going to have to do this post-trade settlement process of, of bringing that inventory to, to to bear at the point that I need to provide it. But the thing is, is at that point, I've already locked in the profit. So I'm able to yeah. make profit by offering liquidity 
and locking in that profit at the point it's traded. And then once it's traded, I bring that inventory across and, 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 and uh, take the sort of the difference between what I was able to buy that inventory at versus what I've sold it at. But now I've locked in that profit, I can, I can be much more aggressive in the liquidity that I offer than I would otherwise need to be. And I don't need to do this scaling up exercise of, of making sure the volume is there for me to offer the liquidity in the first place. Right, right, right. Yeah, exactly. And and it's it's essentially almost zero cost to them, zero cost bootstrapping, right, uh, for the market maker, which I think, which is why I think is like super powerful. Um, yeah, they, it, it's essentially like I don't know if I should bring this up because it gets into <laughs> computer sciencey topics, but it's kind of like um, virtual memory right. in that. There's a, there's a virtual memory, right? Like you, um, you have two to 64 bits of memory, um, but you don't actually have that much physical memory on your laptop, but it looks like to any program that you've got that address space. And it's only when you access a certain memory that physical memory um, is, is assigned to a virtual memory space. Right. Um, and I think kind of similar here, right? Like a market maker provides a virtual order book um you're calling it flash liquidity virtual liquidity is not a bad name too <laughs> no, no think about it but um they provide a a virtual order book and they don't need to provide any um any of that backing to that virtual order book until at the exact point it's needed um, yeah. which is yeah very cool yeah, and I think this actually sort of gets over a large amount of the bootstrapping problem you see in in multi venue trading. Like, there's a reason that sort of places like Binance and Coinbase uh, and things like that end up being so dominant is because um, trading volume begets liquidity, and you have this, as you're saying, this this issue that a a market maker doesn't want to move inventory to a trading volume to a trading venue until volume is there but people don't want to trade it unless liquidity is there what you're able to do here is allow market makers to express liquidity that they have elsewhere in within this system and then only move that inventory at the point that it's that it's taken which solves a lot of the issues that we're seeing when you're looking at um, DEXs in the crypto space. Uh, and one of the big reasons that you often don't see um, crypto that is being very successfully traded within centralized venues being traded that successfully within decentralized venues is a combination of not just the cost of constantly updating your liquidity position on highly volatile or highly traded assets, but also the fact that the volume doesn't justify the bringing across of inventory in the first place. So if you look at things like CowSwap, which is an intent-based X, even though it is an intent-based X and, get, and, and derives a lot of these great properties of being able to have off-ledger intents that are then able to be bundled together and then submitted as transactions on Ledger, you don't get over this problem of not having available inventory. And if you look at the cow swap trading volume, the majority of it is across things that already have a very deep liquidity within the Ethereum ecosystem and not really anything else. And actually, the majority of that is within a very small number of assets within the Ethereum ecosystem, things like uh, ETH things like USDT, things like USDC, and not much else is traded across CowSwap, uh, which makes it very useful for trading good pricing on these sort of like a, a couple of high value assets, but it doesn't make it useful beyond that because there just isn't the, boot, the, the bootstrap liquidity available for you to be able to do large trade, traded size in the first place because you have to bring your inventory to bear anyway. So I think that the, the, this combination of these two things makes it incredibly interesting for the ability to be able to trade sort of a much broader range of assets using the this this very, very powerful set of primitives, i.e. the combination of flash liquidity uh, and intent-based trading. Does, um, does CowSwap, do they, do they actually have um, dedicated market makers or... Yeah. Do they source? They do have dedicated market yeah, makers. Yeah, they do have. De they do have dedicated market makers. Yeah, um, and uh, it's interesting. You sort of see um, a large amount of the volume that happens on CowSwap tends to be 
larger ticket sizes on these yeah. larger assets um just mm -hmm. because the liquidity only makes sense to trade at that size on those items and get all of the advantages the other thing that's sort of interesting about cow swap versus something like anthic is that you actually have to wait quite a long time for your trade to fill so i think that yeah, the yeah. cow swap auctions are once every five minutes no mm -hmm. and so what cow swap does to avoid um uh to avoid um uh, sandwich attacks is they essentially bundle uh, all of the all of the coincidence of one trades that have occurred within a five minute period they then get bundled together and they go through an auction process for the solvers where the solvers in, are incentivized to give the best price to the, the the maximum best price to every single trader that or the like most, the aggregate uh, best highest price. surplus the highest surplus exactly the highest surplus but that means that as a trader as as a as a retail user like waiting five minutes for my trade to confirm is not a very good user experience. So yeah. if I'm doing very large trades, like an OTC style trade, that's okay. You know, I'm I'm trading a hundred thousand dollar clip or a two or a, you know a one million dollar clip. That makes sense. But if I'm trading something where I want to just trade in and out of something, it's it, it, it instantly becomes a lot less user friendly. Whereas what you have with Anthic is you have this ability to you're seeing the pricing constantly come in, so that's a big difference. You're now you're you're seeing what the price is at all times. When you trade on it, it gets confirmed, you know, within five seconds or less. And so now you're trading at the best price possible on a very large range of assets where your trade is confirming within five seconds or less. And suddenly that's looking a lot more like the kind of trading that I would expect on a centralized exchange rather than a decentralized exchange. And that that is partly to do with how market makers connect to uh, Anthic, and it's partly to do with how intense work on, uh, on Anthic, and it's partly to do with how flash liquidity works. Um, but there are also some key design decisions that are different that make it much easier for you to match together uh, an intent to trade against uh, available liquidity very quickly without having the sort of the the problem of uh, front running that you that you have to get around with this sort of like five minute auction process that you see within CowSwap. Mm, right, right, right. What? So what? <clears throat> I suppose let's talk a little bit about where where Anthic is at, at the moment. What's been built so far, and where where is the where's the system at? Sort of um, from a development point of view. Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, Anthic has its own um, challenges from a tech point of view, just because there are so many points of integration. We've got the maker side, we've got the taker side, we've got the solver side, and then we've got also integrations with um, with uh, InstaBridge, as well as update Stellaratix engine uh, and interacting with the ledger itself. So. Um, I, I would say like the the main order book stuff it's it's not easy but it's it's the the crux of the problem of writing anthic is uh, sort of how do we integrate all these things in a very short timeline where we depend on everybody <laughs> and um, and we're trying to get this out as soon as possible um so uh, essentially where we're at is we, we sort of built the whole thing um, um, quite a while back now um, mocking as many things as we could um, so we've mocked the taker side, we've mocked the um, maker side, we've uh, we've done some mocks on the Radix engine, and then also the solver bot, and we've uh, built out what the Antic server will look like. So that's that's looking good. Uh, we've started working with market makers, so they've also they've started plugging into the system, um, given our taker ticker bots, uh, uh, given the rest of the system has been mocked, they were able to integrate okay, and we're we're seeing um, them starting to do fills and, and being successful you know, on their side. And um, just this week, we started really getting the um, starting to get ticker uh, API integration um, on board. Um, and uh, but at the same time, we're currently working on getting uh, sub-intents implemented in the Radix engine, so that's going to be integrated soon as well. Um, so yeah, I think it's all kind of uh, the the core there. The core is there. The whole demo works, and we're just kind of filling things out um, until um, 
and get everything sort of ready. Nice, nice. Uh, and uh, the so you, you're saying you already have like a test process up and running where you can where makers can can push in pricing and and have it taken. Um, so you're already seeing those sort of like bun the bundling together and the submitting to the to the Radix network in a pseudo way, uh, and now it's just sort of pushing in <coughs> the functionality of production, the productionized functionality from this initial sort of like MVP system. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and it's also always, you know, like the the last 20% is always 80% of the work. So like we we, we what got through most of the big stuff and now it's all like fine tuning, getting every, getting all these little kinks and all these things kind of worked out um, to work out. Um, so yeah, um, that's pretty much where we're at. Awesome. But uh, yeah. And um i i think that i think we can sort of wrap it up here but it's been really interesting talking to you josh thank you so much for coming uh, and explaining all of the uh deep things about anthic uh, and i'm sure we'll be able to come back with some with some updates in the not too distant future yeah for sure and if anybody you know has any questions or whatever i'm gonna um try and be on telegram more you can answer any questions awesome mm -hmm. yeah cool thanks Thank you.